Have you ever walked up to the counter, maybe in a McDonald's, at a grocery store, and you run into somebody that has an expression like this? <laughs> and you're thinking, this is probably not going to go well. Maybe they're having a bad day, maybe they're having a bad week, maybe a bad life. But you know that the attitude is one that is all over the face. You can clearly see it. We live in an especially negative society, don't we? When we think about the, being surrounded by people who are plagued with stinking thinking, They've got an attitude problem. They're unhappy about just about everything. They're unhappy about the government. They're unhappy on their jobs. They don't like where they live. There isn't much about anything that they like. And it reflects in their attitude, their disposition. There actually is a business in Houston that's called Tantrums Incorporated. This was a page that I got off of their website. And the ad says, we all have those days when you really can't take it anymore. The kids, the boss, the job, traffic, crowds, the spouse, the list goes on. At Tantrums LLC, we help you release that frustration by totally annihilating a room filled with dishes, TVs, windshields, and more via a sledgehammer, a baseball bat, lead pipe, bowling balls, and more. We promise you will feel relieved and get a great workout of the process. I'm told that their largest clientele are stay-at-home moms. <laughs> so you get to the point where you need to go into a room and you just need to start smashing things. Take that baseball bat and break up as much as you possibly can. How have we gotten to this point? What has happened in our society that has led us to a point where someone who is entrepreneurial, I got to give a prop for that, will say, I think I've got a great idea. Let's have a room where people can smash things and it'll make them feel better. Those of you that are in sports, there's a common saying about those that come in second place. Anybody know what it is? Second place is the first loser. I don't know who came up with that, but I don't like it. There's an attitude about that that sort of reflects part of the negativity Loser, he <laughs> came in second place. I'm more like this guy that says second place obviously is the first loser, but I'll still take the first loser as opposed to third place. <laughs> That's still better. When we think about the negativity and all those things that are going on in life that just reflects a bad attitude. We just have bad attitudes. People are surrounded with bad attitudes. You know, I did a little bit of internet research on road rage. You ever done that? Oh boy. It is incredible the number of incidents in our country that, are, that stem back to road rage. Accidents, fights, murder. All because of uncontrolled 
attitudes. One of my favorite phone messages is, have a good day. Remember, it is a choice. Love that. Nobody makes you have a bad attitude. Like a good attitude, it is a choice. I remember my first preaching job was in Mississippi, and those of you that are here from Mississippi might relate to this, maybe not. But I'm a Colorado boy, born and raised, city boy even, and I'm going to small town North Mississippi, first preaching job. I hated everything about Mississippi. They had bugs as big as mice, cockroaches that were, you could, yeah, make them pets. The humidity, ugh. And I'm a newlywed, actually they hired me when I was single, I got married in my first year there. And my lovely bride heard my bad attitude for months. And finally, one day, she had had enough. And she said, the problem is not Mississippi. The problem is you. You have a horrible attitude. Sometimes you have to admit <coughs> that she was right. She was totally 100% right. And as her words rang in my brain, I got to thinking, there needs to be a change. And so starting on that day, beginning with asking her forgiveness, I started working on my attitude. And four years later, When the time had come to leave Mississippi, I cried. It was a very, very sad day because I had grown to love that state, love the people. Still didn't care about the cockroaches, but everything else. <laughs> it is amazing how an attitude affects everything. Why is it that you've got two men that are ditch diggers and one loves it and one hates it. They do the same work. It's attitude. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't go anywhere without changing it. You cannot progress in life. No one wants to be around someone with a bad attitude and they're not going to go far. No one wants to work with them. The most miserable people are those who care only about themselves understand only their own troubles, and see only their own perspectives. What is it at the core that is at the core of a bad attitude? Experts will say selfishness, self-centeredness. Hmm. We get so wrapped up in it's all about me kind of an attitude. We're looking specifically at Philippians 4.8 and invite you to turn your Bibles to that great, great fourth chapter of Philippians. There's a little thing about epistles in the New Testament that unlock the key to some of the significant things that are being said in these books. Now we have in Philippians chapter 4 verse 2 what are known as petition verbs. Maybe you haven't heard that word before or maybe you're familiar with it. A petition verb... Did we lose me? Am I, am I still on? Okay. Is... When, when you're writing a letter and you want to emphasize something, what are you going to do? You're going to underline it. You're going to maybe make it in bold. 
italicize it. You've got various stylistic ways that you can emphasize a point that you're making. In Greek, they didn't do that. They did it with words. And these words are called petition verbs. And so whenever, for example, in the writings of Paul, we come across a petition verb, what we need to understand is he's screaming this out. This is important. What I am saying is especially significant. And he's doing it with this petition verb that is translated by the word urge. Now what do you notice about Philippians 4 verse 2? The word urge is twice found in the verse. I urge Yodia, I urge Synthache to be of the same mind or to live in harmony in the Lord. That word that is translated live in harmony, it's all one word. For those of you that are interested, it's the Greek word phronain. And the word phronain has to do with thinking. There's an attitude problem between these two women. When we study through the book of Philippians, we're identif- we are, can identify what seems to be the core of the problem. And it is their attitude. Their attitude toward one another especially. And how that is impacting the church at Philippi. When you look at Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, you see the core of the problem. And Paul is appealing to them. He uses this same word three times. We need to work on our attitudes. Consider one another as more important than yourself. And then he goes on to that great section, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Is Paul trying to launch on some little theological treatise? No, he's trying to give an illustration of the right attitude of selflessness. Self-sacrifice, a willingness to be equal with God. How do you get higher than that? You don't. And then he becomes a bondservant. Talk about a a top-to-bottom story. But it wouldn't have happened without the kind of attitude that we see demonstrated in Jesus. Have this attitude in yourself. So I'm urging you, Yodia... I'm urging you, Synthache, to live in harmony, to be of the same mind in the Lord. I've been with Bear Valley for 32 years. In 32 years, I have unfortunately seen the demise of well over 50 congregations, some of which have close their doors. And when you do a little study as to what brought about the demise of a congregation, very rarely it's doctrinal. It's conflict. It's people that couldn't find a way to get along. We recently had a church split in one of the little mountain towns that had 16 people. That couldn't get along. Are you kidding me? When we think about what Paul is saying, these women were having a great impact on the church. When he uses the petition verb, he's crying out that something needs to be done. These are great women. They have been involved in the advancement of the gospel. He compliments them in chapter 1 and the others. But yet there's a problem that needs to be addressed. And it's a problem of attitude. Verse 
when we get to verse 8, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. This is a present imperative verb that is rendered, fill your minds, literally consider, calculate, concentrate, think about, focus on these things. Paul's not making a suggestion. He's wrapping it up. Finally, let's cut to the chase. And what are we talking about in this book? We're talking about our need to get to the point of having the right kind of attitude. Reflect carefully upon these things because it's going to shape your conduct. These good qualities are not merely things that are good for the head. But they filter down to the heart and then they impact the way that we relate to one another. There's selfishness in the church. There's, I don't like the way he prays. I don't like the way he leads songs. I don't like the way he preaches. His announcements are terrible. We can go on and on and we're, we're seeing the negativity and then we wonder why our children are really not all that interested in church when they are old enough to make a choice. I spent five years teaching as a Bible professor in one of our Christian colleges. And folks, I have to tell you, it was tough dealing with these 18-year-olds that had come out of an environment of negativity. Because all they heard on the way home from church was mom and dad griping about this and griping about that. Negative things being said about the sermon, or boy, wasn't that the longest prayer you ever heard. And the little ears are listening. Finally, brethren, think about this. By using these verbs... Paul is one that is making this great appeal. And he breaks it down. And we'll, so we'll do what he does and look at the various aspects. He begins by saying, you need to think about whatever is true. All right, what's, I don't know if you watch CNN or Fox News or some of those, but what is... Donald Trump's major problem with the media. Fake news, right? Fake news. We hear a lot about fake news today. But you know what? For those of us in Christianity, we've been reading about and hearing about fake news for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, you know in John chapter 8, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he said, you're of your father the devil. And he said, John 8, 44, he is the father of lies. And he's been lying ever since. Whatever is true, Satan is the father of lies. And you know what, there, it's amazing the more you study the Bible as you kind of have these light bulb comes on moments. When you think, what are the insidious lies that Satan is telling uh, or spreading in the churches today? And we might brainstorm a little bit and we'd come up with, well, it would be marriage, divorce, remarriage. The role of women. Things like that. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul actually gives us two illustrations of 
some of the lies being told by Satan. So keep your finger in Philippians 4, but go to 1 Timothy for just a minute. First Timothy chapter 4, we'll begin reading with verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. All right, notice the deceitfulness. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, there we go, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. All right, Paul, what are we talking about? What are these deceitful spirits and these doctrines that are coming from demons? Men which forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods. What? <laughs> these are the two huge lies being told by Satan? And it dawned on me, and maybe you were way ahead of me on this one, that Satan knows that it can be maybe the, the smaller things that can completely tear apart a church. Lies. Maybe they're small lies, but they're lies nevertheless. And those lies can be that which eventually just crumbles the church from its very foundation. How can staining from marriage split churches? Have people walk away from religion? How can saying, well, you can't eat that. Destroy a person's faith in God. But Satan knew that it worked. Satan knew that people, they feel oppressed. They feel like they're being shortchanged. And so it destroys their relationship with God. Maybe whatever was plaguing Yodi and Synthaki was... If you back off, you just say, you know, really not that big a deal. But it became one. And having preached for churches that had women that didn't get along, I understand. You do too, if you've been in such an environment. Everybody that's a part of the body of Christ is important. And the harmony that needs to exist is one that is so crucial. And when it's not there... In one church I preached for, we had two women that couldn't get along. Even potlucks weren't fun. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> Whatever is true. With all of the lies being spread, we've got to zero back in on what is the truth. What is the truth? And Jesus said it best in John chapter 8, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If we don't spend time making sure that we go back to what it is that the Bible teaches then we're, all, we're going to be inundated with lies because Satan is spreading them all over the place. Go to the church of your choice. Doesn't matter. Lies being spread. Secondly, he says, whatever is noble, or some versions say honorable. It's difficult to find a good word for this adjective here. Some translations say honest, King James, honorable, ASV, deserving of respect. One possibility is dignified. Sometimes the concept of noble may be expressed in an idiomatic phrase. For example, 
that which causes people to look up or to admire. We're told in the Bible to honor those to whom honor is due, Romans 12, 10, Romans 13, and verse 7. The good, the decent, the hardworking people among us should be honored and lifted up. This isn't rocket science. This is good, basic, fundamental Christianity where we're identifying the people that are doing good jobs. Howard talked about stars. Recognizing and identifying the stars among us. Imagine what your kids sitting in the back seat of the car are thinking if that's the conversation they're hearing on the way home. Man, she is such a wonderful Christian woman. What a great Bible teacher. As long as I've known her, she's been faithful. And little Johnny in the back seat's hearing that. You know, Paul did the same thing in this very book. In chapter 2, and a lot of commentators will say, Paul just sort of kind of lost his place. Because he launches off and he wants to talk a little bit about Timothy and he wants to talk a little bit about Epaphroditus and then he kind of gets back to it in chapter 3. No, not at all, folks. What he's doing is he's given examples of those who have put others above themselves. Jesus, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes to Timothy. Look at Timothy. Look at the kind of man Timothy is. Look at the sacrifices Timothy has made. And then he goes to Epaphroditus and says, Men like him you need to esteem. What's he doing? Think on those kind of people. And then next, he says, whatever is right. This is the third word in this list. Sometimes the word is translated just, like in the RSV, in the NEV. And therefore, right when he gives to God and to his fellow man, what is their due? There's an equity, a justice, a fairness. He accepts and performs his proper duty to God and to man. Do you feel like the concepts of right and wrong are blurred today? You know, Isaiah said in Isaiah 5 and verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. So even in Isaiah's day, 700 years before Christ, there was the idea of blurring of these things, these concepts. In my pornography session, which is in the next hour, do you realize that in a rather extensive survey that was asked about people's perception of various social ills, that failing to recycle was considered far worse than viewing pornography? Whatever is right. This word fits with the golden rule. When Jesus teaches us the principle of treating others the way we want to be treated, we know what right is. But we need to think on that, meditate, give that its due concentration. And then... Moving on, he says, whatever is pure. Jesus taught Matthew 5 and verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. The word blessed means approved of God. Those are the kind of people that God likes, that God puts his stamp of approval on, are those who are pure in heart. Sometimes the word is used of ceremonial activity. Cleansed and is fit to offer to God, is pure in service of God. Similar to the idea of what Paul's telling Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 about the vessel that's cleansed. 
morally pure, undefiled, blameless. There's so much impurity in the world that we're called upon to do something that I think is very challenging and very difficult. But yet, it's still doable. And that is to, to put ourselves in an environment of that which is pure. And then next he talks about lovely. This is the only time in the New Testament this word is found. It calls forth love, that which is love inspiring, causes one to love or what it is that people love. Sometimes we overthink some things. Do you like the mountains? You like lakes, streams, sunsets? You know, I grew up in Colorado. Majestic Rocky Mountains that my mom and dad took me to a lot when I was young. My dad was not a Christian, but my mom was. And mom would not fail to make an observation about the majesty of and the greatness and the power of God as we're looking at those Rocky Mountains. And it wasn't until I was much older that I finally came to realize that it grounded me in my faith in a way I never even thought about at the time. But seeing a mountain and thinking about God or seeing a river and then thinking about God are looking at the beauty of a sunset or a sunrise and then thinking about God and the power of God is faith building. I don't believe Paul is saying any more than that. You say, well, I think Denny just told us to go to the lake. <laughs> yeah, actually I think Paul is telling us. What's lovely? Think on these things. Why is it that God made this planet so beautiful? You know, He didn't have to. He could have made it like the Sierra Desert and given us all bodies that could uh, survive a climate like on Mars, but He chose not to. Why? Because, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 1, it's a part of His nature. We look at the creation, and it's lovely. It's beautiful. And it brings us to some good thoughts in our minds about God, the greatness of God. Then Paul says, whatever is of good repute. This is another Greek term found only here in the New Testament. It basically means something that's good sounding. It's fit. It's pleasant to be heard. Not likely to offend people. Some translations go with decent, reputable. We seem to love the dirt, the bad news. You've probably observed, if you watch the 10 o'clock news, that almost every lead story is bad. And then the one after that, probably, and maybe even the one after that. Why is that? Is it because that's what's happening? No, it's because they're in the business of giving stories that will make people watch. And the feel-good stories, the good news stories, they just don't get viewers. We like the news that seems to have the dirt, the bad news. But it drags us down and it impacts us and it, it affects our attitude. Instead, 
focusing on that which is good. I love the song, Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. Because we do have a lot of blessings. Have you ever visited somebody in the hospital that maybe is suffering from a horrific illness or had a terrible accident and you walk away feeling better? They encouraged you? My dear brother, Cy Stafford, passed away 1st of February. Longtime missionary in Tanzania and someone I consider to be a very close friend. When the doctors told him that his leukemia had come back with a vengeance and there was nothing else they could do, he was going to hospice, going back to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, made a trip to go see Cy for the last time. And I could not have been more encouraged and uplifted by spending that day with him. He was one that it's that positive, good news, optimistic outlook. We saw the same thing in the Apostle Paul in chapter 1 when he's in prison and he's talking about how great it is that the gospel's being preached everywhere. It's that attitude. And Paul says, if there's any excellence, excellence of character, worthy of merit, uncommon character, worthy of praise, too often we set the bar too low. We set as our examples, rock stars, movie stars, athletes as our standard. Those are not excellent people. Jesus is the highest standard. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that we need to be conformed to the image of his son. That's setting the bar where it belongs. Then he says, but it was worthy of praise. He used this word in chapter 1 verse 11 in reference to the praise of God. When we think about praise... Fill in our minds with things to praise. God, of course, and worthy people as well. So we have eight things. Eight points being made by Paul. Let's do a self... Wow. Am I back on? Let's do a self-examination of our attitudes. What is it that you think about, you focus on, you concentrate on? Your studies? This passage could not be more relevant, could it? Timely. When we live in a society that is so unbelievably negative. You're not ever going to have the kind of life that God wants you to have without having that positive attitude. The difference between a good day and a bad day is attitude. When we think about these points, it's what a great blueprint for the home, what a great blueprint for our lives. Think on these things. And when we do that, we'll experience the kind of joy that God wants us to have in our life. So as we do this assessment, are we plagued with stinking thinking? Are we someone that knows how to appreciate the good, the true, the right, the honorable, the just, the excellent, the good reports, and we're thinking on those things. Thank you for your attendance.